you for coming back, and uh, I'm uh, going to do you a favor. I'm going to start out with the uh, punchline to the talk, so uh, you can leave in like 30 seconds if you want to. No, don't do that. Uh, so uh, that is the title of the talk, Running Effective Machine Learning Teams, Common Issues, Challenges, and Solutions. So I'm going to give you the three big things that I'm going to say today. Uh, one is, uh, and you, you probably have seen this, and maybe you already know it, but software engineering for ML is very different from software engineering. I'm going to talk about the specific problems, uh, challenges for software engineering for machine learning, especially when it comes to teams. And that shows up in uh, three different categories, visibility, reproducibility, and collaboration. And we've already heard uh, quite a bit about that uh, this morning. And then the, uh, the big solution, it's a three-pronged solution to solve this, automation, automation, automation. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So uh, before I do, I want to just say a word about one of my favorite topics, uh, me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I, I do know a lot about me. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background, uh, because normally I wouldn't be in this room. I would probably be in the room next. Uh, listening and talking about uh, machine learning, the, the details. So I, uh, I did my PhD thesis in 1997. Uh, I got a dual PhD in cognitive science and computer science. Uh, so that's where my expertise uh, lies. Uh, but for the next 20 years, I was working in robotics and neural networks, continued to work with uh, deep learning. Of course, we didn't call it deep learning. It, it wasn't very deep uh, throughout the the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, and I was a college professor teaching computer science at Bryn Mawr College. Um, so I have some pictures here. There was the, the robots, uh, neural networks, and Python. Uh, I was one of the first people to really talk about Python in the education uh, circles. So I, I've been a big fan of, fan of Python for a very long time. And I brought that uh, to Bryn Mawr College, where I used it to teach uh, computer science and robotics and, and neural networks. Now I'm a head of uh, research at Comet. Uh, we are um, we're trying to do what uh, GitHub Git does for code. We try to do that for machine learning. I'm not going to really talk a lot about that, but I'm going to talk about the problems that we worked on. And one other connection that I'd like to give a shout out to is um, AnacondaCon. Anaconda specifically. Uh, so I am uh, on the Jupiter project team, uh, which just means I'm a contributor, and uh, I have uh, I can approve a PR on certain repositories at Jupiter. Um, and I use Jupiter extensively in my teaching. In fact, uh, the last four years that I taught college, every single one of my courses I taught through Jupiter, including assembly language and uh, programming language, anything in computer science I was using Jupyter for. Um, we, we were the first and longest running Jupyter Hub. And all of that I, I mentioned because all of that sits on Anaconda. So I used to use Anaconda for all my students, but now we use that even to run our Jupyter Hub. But I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about teams. So the agenda for this is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, advances in deep learning over the years. And I want to give a case study about uh, the problems that arise in software engineering for machine learning. And then uh, talk about the main problem areas. And then we can take some questions. So first off, uh, this is not my story. Uh, so, as you know, uh, I was in academics for the last 20 years, and I don't really know anything uh, about real teams in the real world. I'm learning, but uh, I'm stepping in for our CEO, uh, Gideon Mendels, and he wasn't able to be here. So uh, this is really his story and his case, uh, his case study that I'm going to describe. So. Um, before we get that, I want to give sort of an overview of uh, machine learning, specifically deep learning, uh, that how that has changed over the years. I want to give you some examples that are all using the same underlying model, but they're all very different. Um, so, and this is uh, deep learning everywhere. And it does seem like that. 
Uh, some good uses, some not so good uses, but uh, let's take a look at three very good uses. So I'm gonna look at object recognition, speech recognition, game playing, which maybe not everybody immediately thinks that that might be something related to your job, but I think it might be in the future. And then look at the growing number of models, uh, deep learning models in, in business. So the first one, object recognition, and maybe some of you know this data set. So this is called ImageNet. It's 14 million images, uh, like you see here, and they're divided among a thousand different categories or classes. Uh, everything from dog breeds, dog breeds that I couldn't recognize, uh, but specific ones, you know, that this is a border collie and this is a terrier. Uh, but not just dogs, it has a lot of other variety of things like backpacks and toilet tissue. So I don't know why they chose those items, but they did. And that became this uh, data set called ImageNet. And this was the standard that was used in the industry for many years to sort of show the best of your algorithm. And so um, here's the, uh, an example. Uh, the idea is that you give your system one of these pictures. Um, if you say soccer ball, uh, you are correct. Uh, not everybody gets that, believe it or not. Um, and this uh, particular model even assigns a accuracy. So it, it's 93% sure that that's a soccer ball. So this is the problem. And uh, if we look at uh, how this was handled over the years, we see that uh, back in 2011, uh, the best algorithm in the world uh, was uh, at like 26% error. So out of 100, it would get 26 uh, pictures wrong. Uh, and then I have a human performance over here. So, you know, humans aren't perfect. And maybe it's because they don't know the breeds of dogs uh, like I don't. Uh, but what, for whatever reason, they weren't able to identify the five out of 100 pictures. But that's still pretty good. Uh, humans can do five out of 100. But something very interesting happened in 2012 and that was uh, AlexNet. And this is the first time we see one of these deep learning networks at attempt this task. And this was really uh, game changing. So it went from 26% uh, error down to 16% error in one year, which is, was just unheard of, that kind of a, an advance uh, in this task. Now it's still way above uh, human performance, uh, it's still worse, uh, so still some ways to go, but uh, the, uh, the paper came out of uh, work with Jeffrey Hinton, who you may have seen in the news recently, just won the, the Turing Award. So as years came, went on, uh, the, these models were refined, 5% uh, better the next year, 2013, getting even better, 2014, 2014, even better, and I guess you can guess by where that little bar of human performance is, what happened the following year, 2015, uh, human performance was uh, beaten. So now uh, these neural network models are able to beat human performance. And this started uh, back in 2012 with the, the AlexNet. Uh, I think the, the winning uh, model there in 2015 was a, a ResNet, and I believe that's by uh, Microsoft, a Microsoft team. So that, that's the first example. So that was object recognition, uh, a perception task. Uh, the next one uh, is uh, a data set called Switchboard. And this is a really interesting data set, uh, in some ways much harder than the, the vision task um, because it's uh, just telephone conversations recorded in 1990. Uh, I, and I'm not sure exactly what the, the goal was. Uh, this was by Tex Texas Instruments. There are 260 hours of natural speech, just two people talking back and forth. And they have uh, some examples, uh, and it's just people sort of chatting away about farming and growing and how long the winter is. Um, 540 different speakers. Uh, and the goal is to take uh, something like this as input and be able to produce the words as output. 
So a, uh, going from the, the audio to text. Uh, very hard problem given the, the quality, especially of this data set. So this has a similar plot to the object recognition. So uh, back in the 90s and 2000s, there were a variety of different machine learning uh, AI models that were used on this data set. But something interesting happened uh, about the same time that AlexNet came along. Uh, deep neural networks were used on this task and initially didn't do too much better than uh, the previous kinds of models, but very quickly then, uh, again, reached human level performance. And interesting, again, by a Microsoft team. So again, we see a very different problem, audio, but being solved in a very similar way to the object recognition. Uh, now, you might think uh, audio recognition, wait, I, I do this at home. Uh, you might know this comic, uh, this is an XKCD, uh, make me a sandwich. What? Make it yourself. Pseudo make me a sandwich. So this is an inside joke for uh, computer users, uh, pseudo being super user. Uh, so if you just preface anything you want to say with pseudo, make me a sandwich, then it will happen. Well, I thought I would try this on my Google Home, and uh, this is actually, I, I did a Google search later, this is something that people try with uh, Google and Alexa. Uh, the first thing is, it's great that it's uh, able to understand the words that you say, uh, and, but that doesn't always happen, so we still have a little bit of room to go, but this is the conversation I had with my uh, Google Home. Okay, Google, make me a sandwich. And the Google Home, and I don't know if this is a, double level joke, but it said, well, I'm not very good at spells, and I wondered where this was going, but all right, you are now a sandwich. So, oh, Harry Potter joke, I guess. Uh, so I don't know if it was uh, some kind of mix up at the level of understanding, or if this was just a double layer joke. But uh, we still have some distance to go for general purpose audio, but, but we're very good. Uh, so. So the last example uh, of categories of these uh, different uh, deep learning is Alpha Zero. And this uh, made the news over the last couple of years. Uh, this is a game playing neural network. It's very similar to the other kinds of networks that I just showed. Uh, this was in two, 2017. This particular uh, version had 84 layers of, uh, of neurons, of weights. Uh, I think 84 were, were more weights than I had in the neural network I did in my dissertation, let, a, let alone 84 layers of these weights. And I couldn't find an exact number, but it's millions and millions, maybe tens of millions of t trainable parameters, uh, weights. Uh, this is used in uh, heuristic search in combination with a, a Monte Carlo uh, search tree. And it, it learns by playing itself. And this is a common theme we see in neural networks uh, with GANs and other kinds of uh, self-learning systems. Uh, just to give you a hint though, that this, not any research could do this. Uh, if you were to try to do the same experiment, it would maybe take you 1,700 years of training on your, your uh, GPU. This was Google though, so they had access to some hardware that, uh, that we don't. So the problem in this one is given the state of a board, and, and Alpha Zero can really play any game, not just Go. It can play chess or checkers or, or perhaps even step beyond the game playing arena and maybe do something interesting for data scientists. We're not gonna talk about that today. What we're gonna talk though is about the, what we thought was a logic problem, it turned it into a perception problem. And that was really what I, where I was when I was writing my dissertation uh, on an analogy making, learning to see, learning to perceive these deep problems. So this strategy of using deep learning on lots of different problems uh, was being used at Google. Uh, so this is a chart of all the internal models that uh, were uh, created at Google internally, I, I believe. And you can see that, you know, not only are there are a lot of more people using um, machine learning, deep learning models, but they come from a variety of different groups. 
So everything from YouTube to photos, image understanding, just all over the company, they're really taking advantage of this. And so that's what I really want to talk about is what kind of problems would a team have that are, are working on problems like this? So, okay, this is showing interestingly. Um, okay, so, uh, so we're learning, that we're getting a lot from academics. The academic, these are all academic problems, these benchmarks, the ImageNet, uh, the voice recognition, playing games, uh, this is all from the academic world. So how can we take that and apply it effectively in the business world? So we believe that the biggest obstacles uh, couldn't be, uh, are actually the biggest obstacles are the processes and the tools that we use are our problem. And uh, this uh, shows itself in visibility, reproducibility, and collaboration. So let's take a look at a case study. And this uh, happens to have come from uh, a real world problem that Gideon uh, was uh, wrestling with at Google. And the very first project that he worked on was a hate speech classification problem. And I was going to show you some examples of what this process looks like and what the hate speech looked like, but it was just, just too terrible to even, you know, glimpse at. But you can imagine, of course, if you read the comments in many places, you, you get a sense of this. But the problem here is that you have YouTube and there are these videos and anybody can go on there and comment on that. And you have people of all ages and you really don't want to have this being a, uh, you know, a cesspool of commentary. You want it to be an inviting, welcoming place. So the goal was to uh, take these comments that are put on, um, on Google, uh, YouTube, and uh, determine whether or not it is hate speech or not. And I'm not gonna define hate speech right now, but you can Im imagine just some vile, really terrible comments that really have no business uh, being put on you know, somebody's video. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, they have a more specific meaning, of course, because uh, they, ha they have to deal with the, the details. But the goal is, you know, enter a comment, uh, d identify it in a binary way, uh, hate speech, not hate speech. And one of the problems with this, they only had a few thousand labeled comments. So he was given a goal with a small team, uh, try to outperform the production model. Okay, a reasonable goal. So the first thing that they asked was, well, where do we start? Uh, what's running in production? And believe it or not, that turned out to be a really hard, almost impossible question to answer. What, what, what are you currently doing? What, how was it built? How was it designed? So they, they couldn't find uh, exactly, uh, well, they found the training code. That was in a Git repository or in version control. And, uh, but the, the data that was used to train it, it wasn't exactly clear which data set. They had a few, and they had different versions that had changed over the years, things added, removed, changed. So it wasn't exactly c clear what the training set was. And the exact hyperparameters weren't saved. So they didn't know what those were as well. And so um, I think they weren't even sure what the accuracy or the precision of the model was until the, I, I believe they asked around and they got that through email, through some ex member of the team. So it was really a hodgepodge of trying to assemble and reproduce the, the, the model that was in production. It's actively being used millions of times every day, and they didn't have the ability to, to recreate it. So how could they make it better if they couldn't really start with the, what they had? So uh, this had all these component pieces uh, that were, they were trying to reassemble and reproduce the experiment so that they could go on from there. So they, uh, they were able to piece together the production model, and I'm not gonna go into the details uh, of exactly what kind of model it was, but it, except to say that it uh, used paragraph vectors that were 
trained or learned through an unsuper unsupervised learning algorithm, and then they use a support vector machine uh, as the classifier to, to say um, hate speech, not hate speech. So they were able to put, uh, put this together and they uh, started guessing at hyperparameters and they were able to exactly match the performance of the production machine, which was uh, in this case 95% accuracy. So at, at the time that they started, the production was uh, getting 95% of hate speech, not hate speech problems correct. And so they were able to build the model that also got 95% so the first th stop that they thought they would do, and this is what we always do in academics, if you want to show that your model is really good, you build a really stupid model that you know you can beat. And so we call it the, the baseline um, model. And it's usually something very simple, uh, and you want to show that all the work that you put into this was worth it because we really you know, crush the baseline. So they started thinking about the simplest kind of model they could build. And I'm not going to go into the details of this, except to say it was an ingram-based model. So they were taking um, first uh, single words and pairs of words, triplets of words, and they were coming up with a representation for those, uh, those tuple of words, and uh, combined with stemming, which is a, a basic uh, process that you would do in uh, Natural Language Processing 101, uh, basically taking um, words, processing, processed, and uh, just finding a root word and mapping all of those variations, uh, throwing tints out the window and, and mapping it to a single uh, representation. So this was an ingram-based uh, model with a little bit of thought about stemming and a little bit of processing, a little bit of data wrangling. And they put together this baseline model, and uh-oh, <laughs> it did better than their production model, uh, quite a bit better. Uh, so they showed this, and it was 97% uh, over the production model that was 95%. So that was surprising, and uh, you know, very surprising. Uh, so they were like, well, what do we do from here? And they, well, maybe we can do even better. If the simplest model gives us 97% correct, uh, let's go to the literature and see what is going on and see if we can implement that. So they did, and guess what? It's that same kind of neural network model that was we've seen already in a few different places. This is a convolutional neural networks, a CNN, and uh, you might recognize some names on that paper. Uh, another winner of the Turing Award. And in this paper, uh, they ha did a little comparison between, oh, n-grams. So n-grams compared to convolutional neural network, and the convolutional neural network really beat uh, the n-gram model. So th great, they've, they've got an n-gram model, and it's beating, it's the, you know, the baseline, and it's beating the production model, so this looks really encouraging. So they put together this model, and hmm, surprisingly, it did worse. The CNN uh, from the paper that they replicated did worse than the baseline model. It still beat production, which is good, but it wasn't as good as the baseline model uh, again. And so they thought, well, what's wrong? What could be wrong? So they went back, and of course, the software engineering for neural networks involves the same kind of debugging that you have to do for any kind of software engineering. You can have bugs, but it also involves another layer. But they went through and they did the standard testing and you know code reviews, and everything looked good. So but maybe they, they had a bug they couldn't find. So what they did was they thought, well, one good way is to reproduce what we saw in the original paper. Well, how could they do that? That was from a competing company. So they're at uh, Google, and the paper came out of Yahoo. Uh, so they sent email to uh, the people, and very kindly, they sh shared their data set. And so now they were able to um, take their, uh, I think, yeah, they got the exact data set and they tried uh, the data set with their version of the CNN and it gave exactly the same performance that the paper reported. 
So this was, uh, so this is one of the Turing Award winners papers back in the early days. And this was exactly the result that they showed, uh, that the CNN beat the engrams uh, by a substantial amount. So, uh, so they were cl clear uh, that they were reproducing this model and that now they know it worked because they got exactly the same results that uh, they got from the paper. But this is odd. Uh, the, the CNN in the paper beat the engram, but in the rep reproducing experiments they were doing, the CNN did not beat the, uh, the, the engram. So they thought, hmm, maybe we should try our engram algorithm on the same data set. So they, they were getting ready to move on because this really wasn't their problem that they were working on. This is Yahoo's data, and they were more interested, of course, in the hate speech uh, YouTube problem. But they decided to try their algorithm, and the engram beat the CNN. Now remember, this is uh, the Turing Award winner paper who you know, got rewarded for the CNN where they showed that the CNN beat the engram. Well, here's another version of the engram that beats the CNN. So what was different? Who knows? We, we don't really have the details to be able to go in and find the differences, but it, it's pretty substantial w whatever those differences are. Um, they spent a lot of time uh, really f uh, polishing that engram and, and making it work very well. But who knows exactly what the cause is between the engram, their engram and the original uh, in -gram. You probably wouldn't have, that paper wouldn't have been published if this had been the result, unfortunately. Uh, negative results don't look so good always. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're publishing about a new CNN and it doesn't even beat the simple engram, um, well, you would probably go back to the drawing board. But I guess luckily for them, it did beat uh, the, their simplest model. So, w what did we learn? Um, well, the CNN was reproducible. They were able to do that, but the engram model wasn't. Uh, they did spend months of research changing down, uh, tracking down wrong techniques uh, to try to get back to, uh, that they, they couldn't get to because of the lack of visibility, the lack of transparency. All of this data spread throughout, not only you know, their own company, email and repositories and other uh, methods, but also this was spread between companies, of course. Uh, so if they only had full visibility into the entire process, a lot of this back and forth and trial and error could have been avoided. So uh, what does the visibility mean in machine learning? Well, here are some questions that you might ask yourself. Uh, can the team, your machine learning team, manage, manager observe what the engineers are training? Do, do they have a good bird's eye view of what's going on? Uh, what model is actually running production? Do you have a good sense of, of what it is that you're doing? Uh, what metric was used to optimize the model? What, what are the details? What data was used specifically? Is that data still relevant? What hyperparameters were used to train the model? And here's one that you don't often think about. You hope it doesn't happen, but of course it does. What happens? when a team member quits? How do you pick up from where they left off? Huge problem. So barriers to visibility, barriers to uh, uh, being able to see what's going on. Well, there are lots of different pieces. You know, there's the data, the code, the configuration, the results. All of those are created at different steps in the pipeline. But then there's the Teams, there are different teams responsible for different aspects of this uh, workflow. And each of those team members perhaps use different tools and infrastructure. How can you assemble all of that together in order to make a coherent picture? So, uh, yeah, work fine in dev. <laughs> so, the, part of this is connected to collaboration. You, you don't want these siloed teams, you really want the teams working together. But in, on all, in all honesty, uh, many teams aren't really teams at all. They're really groups of lone wolves sitting in the same room 
working on slightly related projects. You want to bring that together. You want to bring them closer together. Uh, and also, uh, machine learning involves uh, processes that uh, have multiple units that need easy ways to communicate. So if we can solve the visibility problem, we can allow a lot more communication, useful communication between teams and teammates. So wait a minute. Isn't this a solved problem? Uh, are you thinking of three letters? Start with G, end in T, and have an I in the middle? It, isn't this solved by Git? Well, maybe. And maybe part of it is. But here's a little example of uh, Git. Um, here we're checking out a new uh, branch. Uh, we train the model. And we even are really good about saving the results. Uh, we add the results to uh, the Git. We create a new uh, commit, and we push it. Are we done? Does anybody see any problems with that? Did we get it all? Are you going to be able to go back and reproduce this experiment in six months? Well, I, I'm highly suspicious of that. New experiment one, that's not very detailed. What about the parameters? 0 0.01 and 3? I mean, these, this is an example. But imagine you had many, you know, 100 parameters. Where are they? They're at the command line. We didn't save those. Maybe we save them in the results if we printed them out, but not in a way that really makes this reproducible. So if you look at uh, what's actually created in Git, you see a lot of uh, branches that have names that we could probably do a better job naming. But even if we did, it's not a very good way of trying to collect an, the details of an experiment. And even if you go into that, and look, there might be lots of different solutions, and it might not be clear how to connect all of the, the parts together. So Git is part of a solution, but it, it's not the whole picture. So normal software engineering uh, looks like a dream uh, compared to what we're wrestling with in machine learning uh, software engineering. We have this nice uh, flow. And I think the previous speaker was talking about you know, very easily being able to go in and uh, divide the pipeline up into groups and uh, manage those. But uh, yeah, this, this is nice. But that is not the way that machine learning looks like. And I'm not going to go into the details of this very scary pipeline. But this is actually pretty accurate as to how a machine learning product goes from beginning to end. Uh, it's got some loops in here, so we've got some data. And of course, data in a machine learning task is not something that you just feed in. It's something that changes all the time and is related to the rest of this process. And the training happens down here and back. Of course, it comes back around, and you're doing some testing. And this whole process is really something that you want to have your head around. You want to be able to understand and analyze the entire process. And uh, tools like uh, Git don't really help solve this dynamic aspect of machine learning software engineering. So what does the ideal so solution look like? Automation. If, you have, if you're going to try to do this through any kind of manual means by making the engineers, managers, and others involved in this, do something uh, that's outside what they would normally do when they're doing their experiments, that's probably not going to fail. If you have a tool that's automated that can, uh, whatever tool it might be that they're using, be able to uh, automatically log and help you manage all of these different aspects of an experiment, that's the kind of solution that you're looking for. Uh, so it, it can't get in the way. You don't want to have your people, your teams, adapt to something that's foreign to them. You want a tool that can adapt to them. And if you're good at this, if you really solve the re reproducibility problem, then you've got a lot of other things that are really exciting that you get for free. You get uh, collaboration, good collaboration, people actually talking and understanding what they're uh, doing. You get increased visibility on all aspects of the overall flow. Um, you get comparisons between different experiments. You have efficient debugging. You can do uh, comparisons, diff, 
between two dynamic processes, these experiments. So this is an example of um, a visualization that we have. Each one of these lines uh, running from left to right is an experiment. And you can see it goes through uh, different points along each one of these uh, parameters. And uh, it, we can see that right, he oops, right here is a sweet spot and this really makes a lot of difference. So it really, we can throw away a lot of this analysis. This is a critical piece. So in the future, uh, we b hope that these tools become standardized and your adoption or not as to this impacts your team's productivity and your success. And uh, we hope you make the right decision. So I think I will stop right there. Thanks.